Guy here with a quick message before we get on with the pod. As a thank you to our most dedicated and loyal viewers and listeners to Blood Red, we're inviting you to join our Blood Red Club. By joining, you'll get access to insider transfer content as well as interviews with former favourites and those connected at Anfield. All you need to do is head to bloodredpodcast.co.uk, enter your email address and our exclusive content will head to your inbox. That's bloodredpodcast.co.uk. Thanks. Now on with the show. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's episode of Analyzing Anfield, your tactics and analytics podcast, courtesy of the Blood Red channel. I'm rejoined by starting man David Hughes. Dave, how was your break? Uh, very good, thanks mate. I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it and um, <laughs> I'm o- overly joyed to, to back in the hot seat today. Um, well, if you, if you believe that. You know, <laughs> I probably would have preferred another week off. But, um, yeah, there's, there's worse things to do, isn't there, on a Wednesday morning then talk about football. No, it was a deserved break, mate. And uh, Guy Clark was the usual standing, solid appearance, solid 8 out of 10, I'd give him, actually. Um, but, yeah, it's good to be back to familiar circumstances. So, this week, analyzing and feel we're going to speak about something different, something that we've never usually really done. Um, it was a suggestion put forward by one of our producers. So every now and then we obviously talk about scouting players. We talk about players that are maybe just under the radar. We flag players who are interesting to us for a variety of reasons. But we never do clubs. So this week, you know, with, with it being all quiet on the club front, me and David just going to flag a variety of clubs, turn to peace. I don't know his, he doesn't know mine. And we're just going to flag clubs from throughout Europe and beyond, really, um, regarding their recruitment and, you know, sort of little differences between certain clubs, interesting little quirks attached to certain clubs, clubs that maybe use data, clubs that don't, you know. Um, and we're going to see where we go with it, because, uh, as I said, we've never done it before, Dave. Yeah, it's an it's interesting subject, you know, especially for... For the listeners of of this podcast, uh, hopefully it's it's one that they might they might enjoy. But before we do, I think it's it's time to give ourselves a little pat on the back, mate. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the Euros is going fairly well for a few of the players that we flagged. Um, I mean, we did flag a fair few, to be fair. Some of which haven't even played. You know, I, I mentioned Jules Koundé. I mentioned Florian Neuhaus. Um, who, who incessantly got on the news a few days later, but they haven't played. Certain other players, though, seem to have hit the ground running, mate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think you could argue, on, on one hand, that our approach was, you know, if you're naming enough, a few will do well. <laughs> but, you know, we're going to we're gonna argue differently and say we've, you know, we handpicked a few names. And, yeah, a couple of them have, have done well. You know, they've kind of had kind of telling impacts for their nation so far. Yeah, you know, um, I think Mail at Denmark has been a really good shout. Damsgaard, I think you mentioned, Dave, has been a decent yeah. shout. Yeah, Sco- scored a fantastic goal against Russia. Um, yeah. I-, I don't know if you managed to catch it. It was an absolutely beautiful goal. And yeah, he-, he, did- he didn't start the first game, but he started the last two against Russia and Belgium. And he's done really well. And you know what? On him, Josh, dare to say. Uh, you know, it might be lazy because we talk about Liverpool so much, but he, for me, when when I looked at him more, uh, a post that Russia game, uh, he's the, he, he's a player who could potentially take a lot of Liverpool boxes. You know, if you he's a really good age, um, looks like he's got he's got a really high ceiling. Obviously, he's still just twenty, so further development is is needed, but. Just in terms of the player, is he's technically really good. You know, he's really versatile and play different positions across the kind of across the attack. And I think if, if Liverpool do kind of shift for, away from the four three three, which we think they might um, eventually, or you know, just be a little bit more fluid in their approach and need more uh, creativity from more central positions, then then he he could bring that. I know he's a left side of the attacker predominantly, but you see him playing everywhere. You see him playing through the middle up top um, and even when he's playing on the life left he's still kind of drifting in you know a bit like they say like a Coutinho 
not not in terms of the the, the player profile, but just the way he played. You know, he was, he was more like a number ten, wasn't he, at times than say a left sided winger. And um, yeah, it's just not, not maybe not this summer, but Damsgaard maybe could be one to to watch from a Liverpool point of view over the next uh, year or two. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, you know, Daniel Marlon is another player who's who's done quite well. He's only played a total so far of about ninety minutes. But in that time for for the Dutch, he's, he's assisted twice. Um, in addition to that, I think Christoph Baumgartner, I may be mentioned for Austria. I think he's scored once. Um, so yeah, we're doing fairly well. Nikola Vlasic as well, Dave. Uh, I think he scored last night against the Scots. Yeah, again, yeah, he's a. Uh, he was another one I was just about to to, to add to our list. There, he's um, again legitimate credentials to kind of come back to the. Come back to the Premier League. I think he's a um, he's proven uh, in Russia. He's a really good player. He's 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 proven to be a really important player for Croatia. And yet scored an important goal against Scotland. Um, and you know, I just I think Liverpool. It would be a very good move for Liverpool if they if they brought in Vlasic. I don't think he'd break the bank. I think he didn't. That would annoy Evertonians to no ends. Um, and he could actually go on to be a really good player. Yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens because, as you say, I do think he's probably quite deserving of a move now. Um, but yeah, we'll keep doing that every now and then. We'll we'll check up on the Euros every now and then, see how it's going. Obviously, the knockout stage is uh, on the horizon now, so maybe we'll do another little Euros pod um, going towards the finals and stuff. But in terms of clubs, then Dave, you know, focusing on recruitment and things like that, clubs that are interesting, clubs that you want to talk about. I let you go first. I assume there might be a few a few crossovers, but hopefully not. Um, but yeah, you can go first, mate. Yeah, you know, I start with I guess a quite basic one. Um, it's a club that we speak about a lot because they're in the Premier League. Yeah, um, you know, we, they've impressed us in different ways, and and that's Brighton. Um, I, you know, I I think what. What Brighton have done, if you if you think about the fact that they come up in what was around 2016, 2017, they've they've after what was it thirty odd years after the Premier League, they've managed to stabilise themselves as a, a a solid Premier League side, finishing around fifteenth, sixteenth. But within that time, you know they've clearly kind of evolved as a club. Uh, I think they've got a really kind of progressive owner in place in the form of you know Tony Bl- Tony Bloom who. For those who don't know, I mean, you can find so much reading material about him and, you know, various kind of people talking about him on podcasts because he's quite a unique and interesting character. Um, he was a professional gambler. Then he set up a, I think it was like a, a betting analysis platform or something along those lines, wasn't it, Josh? Um, but he, he was really successful within the same, obviously, goes and buys his boyhood club, Brighton. And, um, and you can kind of see these... These little indicators that the you know data and statistics are really important uh, at Brighton, uh, and then you know the recruitment's been really good. You know, they seem to have a really good mix of bringing in players who are a really good age, look to have a high ceiling, but then there's also experience when needed as well. Um, you know, you've got I brought up a list here because I knew we'd talk about them bringing in players like Trossard, who was obviously kind of highlighting himself as a really exciting player for for Genk. Uh, Mumpai from Brentford, who you know we may or may not speak about them on this show because uh, they're within this kind of sphere. Uh, then you got like Webster, who, who was really good at Bristol City. You know these are players all twenty four and under. But then you'll see them bring in like Adam Lallana, someone like that, or you know Aaron Boy, just just bringing in experience as well to a these kind of players with you know a high ceiling who look like they're going to be go on to be really good. Um, uh, just just one more thing I want to add on Brighton just before we move on is, you know, not only have they stabilised as a Premier League side, but they've also managed to take some kind of really big sweeping changes. You know, they've 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 improved the stadium a lot. Um, you know, the infrastructure they've got a really good stadium in place now, Premier League stadium. Uh, and on the pitch, you know, they've they had like Chris Chris Hutton in. Um, you know, who you know what you're getting with as a manager, you know, steady pair of hands, that type of thing. But you can see that they, they obviously want to go a more progressive route, you know, thinking long term. 
Um, so they, they, they sacked him, let him go when they didn't really need to and brought in Potter, you know, with a, a more um, aggressive identity, I guess. Um, you know, looks to be a top up and coming manager. They're obviously planning for the long term with him in place. Uh, they've recruited really well to, to support him. And I think it, to, to kind of make a sweep and change like that while still being really competitive on the pitch, you know, maintaining uh, Premier League status, I, I think you've got to take hats off to them. And they, they're clearly a well run club. Yeah, I think that they are very interesting. One thing I particularly like with Brighton is uh, it's quite a varied recruitment model, but I think when it comes to taking risks and buying from really weird clubs, essentially, they're, they're more than willing to do it. Um, and I think a lot of clubs steer away from that sort of thing. Like, for example, Jacob Moda, who we flagged on the last podcast that we recorded, I think, for the Euros. You know, he, he came from Lech Poznan. For example, you got a player called Andy Zakiri from a club and sport. Um Josh Arts obviously came from Genk, a little bit more well known, but still quite a, a different club when it comes to moving straight to the Premier League. Alexis McAllister came from um Argentinos Juniors. Um Jahanbash, although he's not particularly worked out, came from Azad Alkmaar, uh, Percy Tau came from Sundowns. So, you know, these are really obscure locations really to get players from, but most of them I think have, have fitted into what Brighton are doing. And, you know, you mentioned there about Tony Bloom. Yeah, professional gambler and stuff. He's the owner of a, a company called Star Lizard. Um, and that's a business that markets itself as a betting consultancy agency. And uh, according to this piece, which I've read before, Star Lizard... Um, has around 1 million placed in bets weekly on any football game. So they're just really, really high-risk gamblers, I suppose, based on mm-hmm. informed stuff, using the numbers and things. So obviously he's applied that to player recruitment and uh, it brings in the odd interest and players to Brighton. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm going to stay as well, relatively close to home. Uh, I'm going to stay in England. And I'm going to go to Norwich. Um, so again, have we got a clash? <laughs> yeah, but the, yeah, yeah, that's fine. No, the, the good ones to speak about, definitely. Yeah, just very obviously, really insistent. Um, the kind of guy that at the minute, I suppose, by Stuart Webber, who I think is really good, really brutally honest, very down to earth, and used to work at Liverpool. Funnily enough, he's down as Liverpool's former head of scouting. Um, I think he had something to do with the academy once as well, maybe directed the academy or something. I'm not too sure. It's difficult to find about them previous roles sometimes. But he just seems to kind of get it, I think, is probably a way of putting it. And again, similar to Brighton, just really willing to take risks on players that other teams would maybe avoid. Like, for example, um, Emi Buendia. You know, he's a player who has just been sold to Aston Villa for about 35 million, I think. And Norwich got Buendia from Getafe after a loan spell in the Spanish second division at a place called Cultural Leonese. Um, And one thing Webb has since stated is that Buendia showed up in the data. Apparently, you know, apparently according to the data, he should have been registered far more assists than he actually registered. I wrote a piece on that very recently. Um, and Nodge managed to pick him up for, for a reduced fee. Obviously, he turned into be a bit of a world beater. Um, and now he's, now he's doing big things and pairing him with Timu Puki, who again was available for fairly low. And uh, another interesting reason that I've flagged Norwich is obviously their recent business, Dave. Uh, yesterday announced the signature of Milot Rashica from where the Werder Bremen for about nine million. And he's a player that I'm pretty sure I flagged when we were doing our little scouting picks episodes. Not this season, just finished, but last season, because he was showing up as a really interesting player. For whatever reason, he had a quiet season this year. Um but Norwich have obviously taken that risk on him and signed him for about nine million. And I think next season it'll be really interesting to see how we see how he gets on because he's He's quite stocky, but he's fast, forward, really direct, 
shoots from mad locations sometimes, but he's just quite an erratic attacker. Really, you, you can do things for you in the middle of nowhere. And as I said, you know, they take risks. He signed a player called, I'm not even going to attempt his first name, but his surname is Placetta. And he got him from Slach Rowclaw. And he's extremely fast. And, you, you know, usually if you're selling a player who has a bit of speed, you had a bit of premium, a bit of a premium on there, really. Um, so he starts performance to a certain level, and you'll probably make a profit on him. But I think just overall, Stuart Webb has done really well when it comes to keeping Norwich competitive and getting in these gems while selling really high. I suppose essentially what Liverpool do, but on a much smaller scale. And if you're doing it on a smaller scale, it can be a lot harder to identify those gems. You know, like a gem for Liverpool is like Diego Jota, who everyone already knows anyway. A gem for Norwich has to come from a much more obscure place, but they seem to do it very well. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah, I think they do do it. You could argue they do it better than Liverpool, but that's not really a criticism of Liverpool, just because Liverpool are so much bigger. You know, players that would be a success, or, you know, at Norwich wouldn't necessarily succeed at at, uh, at Liverpool. But, yeah, I think Norwich is a really good example, especially on the subject of recruitment, uh, because, you know, you look at that, that you sell them when they for the, the profit that they did bring in in Russia, that's, that's just... It's it, you know it's not as straightforward as a like for like, but it's certainly filled that void very quickly, isn't it? You think of um, he sold Ben Godfrey to Everton uh, for a lot of money in the summer. Um, Max Max Aaron's as well. He's almost certainly going to move at some point. You know he, he's constantly being linked to really big clubs. You've got Cantwell and stuff who will who will inevitably prob- probably move on at one stage or another. You just seem to be really good at yeah taking those risks. Uh, uh, Signing that signing players who they obviously bring in, but what they do really well is develop them. You know it, that that's clear as anything. They develop these these prospects, um, and that's why they, they're so successful in the market. Um, another thing that I, I think they probably deserve credit for, Josh, while all this is going on, and some people see this as a negative, but I think when you consider the resources the club have, uh, it, it should kind of be applauded. And, and it's the fact that the he's been a bit of a yo-yo club. But I'm talking about that from a positive point of view. Normally, it's spoken about as a huge negative, isn't it? But if you think about over the last 10 years, in fact, let's bring it up two seconds. Over the last 10 years, uh, Championship, Premier League, Premier League, Premier League, Championship, back up to the Premier League, Championship, 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 back up to the Premier League, Championship, Premier League. So, you know, they're in a position where they have to kind of bouncing from, say, lower Premier League to upper championship, but the the they're being very measured in their approach, no matter which way it goes. Whether they get promoted, they're measured in their approach. They get re- relegated, they're measured again. You know, they're doing it so they can be sustainable. They're kind of bouncing from um these two positions year in, year out. But I assume with the idea of the long term goal being that they're stable enough to then build upon where they are and then become a stable Premier League side, as opposed to doing like what, um, it was a good example, just Fulham, you know, Fulham coming up and spending a fortune and kind of going back down. And there's been much better examples of clubs just spending a fortune, not thinking long-term, just thinking all about getting up or, you know, once up trying to just desperately throw money out to stay up. And as I said, I think Norwich have done a really good job of being well-run and therefore not suffering big time financially when getting relegated. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned sustainable there. Well, when I checked last season, Premier League clubs, and I was looking at every club in the Premier League and their net spend over the course of the past five years. Net spend is just basically, you know, whatever you spend compared to whatever you make in sales. And when I checked last season, every single Premier League club was in the red in terms of their net spend, except Norwich. Norwich were in the green. So over a five-year period, Norwich were the only side in the Premier League last season to have sold more than what they've actually spent. And, you know, as you just said, in addition to doing that, they've managed to still achieve the occasional promotion, which is easier said than done. You know, a lot of clubs struggle to do it. I think when you said overcome it and there to try and achieve promotion, I think Stoke are probably a good example. 
Um, they're obviously struggling at the minute. And I think Aston Villa as well absolutely scraped it. But I think they were really, really lucky when they came up. They came up via the, via the playoffs, I think. But at that point, half their squad was on loan. Um, you know, it was, yeah. it was real make or break. So they were very lucky. But I think Norwich, as you say, are doing it in a way that works for them long term. You know, they haven't got mega Rich Jones, Stallone, Stallone by Delia Smith and um, Michael, what is it? Say any? Uh, I can't remember. Uh, no, I can't. I'll double check now, but yeah, they, they, haven't, they haven't got mega rich owners anyway. Um, but they're still finding a way to do it through player sales, and it's it's relatively successful. I think uh, another good example of a, a failure because Aston Villa was a good example. Um, they rolled the dice big time and just managed to get away with it. But I think a team who haven't is Derby County. You know they've kind of yeah. been in and around that top six area and they've just kind of thrown money at it and it's it's all fell apart for them really they, they nearly got relegated you know on the on the final day didn't they from the championship last season and they look a little bit of a mess uh, so they're basically you know what can happen if you don't get that that rubber degree yeah uh michael win jones it was so if michael's listening apologies mate um <laughs> but i doubt it's all um, yeah, but so Dave, right. I'll let you. Uh, I'll let you go next. Yeah, um, I'll stay in England, but uh, not on the not in the Premier League. And just a quick uh, mention for Barnsley because they've kind of low key been doing good stuff uh, for a few years now. Um, recruitment is very data heavy. Um, they've instilled a, a model at the club, which means that they're not no longer kind of reliant on a a set manager coming in and, and basically taking full control and having it his way and trying to be successful, which, you know, at, at the championship, can it, the championship has such a high turnover in terms of managers because a couple of reasons really I have a, a theory, well, a couple of theories on it. I think the fact that it's a really difficult league to compete in, you know, anybody can beat anyone. Um, so it's really hard to sustain a, a positive run in that league. And I'd, I don't think it would be unfair to say, Josh, at the start of a the season, there's at least 65, 70% of that division with ambitions of getting promoted, whether it be automatic or by the playoff. So obviously, there's only three teams who can go up. So if you're one of these teams who aren't getting there, it can be very, it can, you know, put the pressure on very quickly to want to change things, change managers. So there's a high turnover in that aspect. But then also, if you're a really good manager in that division, ultimately, it's the second tier and you're susceptible to, to losing your manager to bigger and better clubs. I think what Barnsley have done really well, as I said, they've got a model in place. And it's a very kind of, I want to say it's a Red Bull-esque model, but obviously a much smaller scale. <clears throat> um, the philosophy is clear. They're a team who are very direct, probably one of the most direct teams in England, to be honest. It's about getting the ball from uh, A to B fast, getting up the bit pitch quickly um, and pressing aggressively without the ball, whether that's counter-pressing or whether it's just getting the ball into the opposition's half and then trying to force turnovers over there. They're really aggressive. They've got the, uh, the lowest PPDA in the championship or they did have last season. Um, also, interestingly though, Josh, I think the recruitment is uh, is low key quite good as well, and it, it's clear what they're doing, trying to bring in young players or you know make make use of the loan market like they did with Dyke from Orlando, uh, but bringing in young players and relying on them as well. They've got the young, they had the youngest average uh, age in the championship last season, um, and this all kind of accumulated to them having this this philosophy. They had these young players, these hungry players. It's uh, it accumulated to them, you know, making it into the playoffs and obviously just missing out on reaching the final and maybe a spot in the in the Premier League. Now, obviously, those who keep an eye on it will know that their manager, um, Valerian Ishmael, I think is the pronunciation, he's been in charge only since October, uh, but it looks like he's on course to join West Brom. But, you know, I think Barnsley can afford to lose their manager without it being a huge setback for them because as I said he only come in from October and he, he replaced Strubar who obviously joined New York Red Bulls 
which again says a lot about the the similarities in the in the profiles of those kind of two organisations. So I said to the club, you seem to do, be doing some good low key work, and the ones to definitely to keep an eye on because they haven't got the biggest revenue either. I think what they're doing really well is you know trying to cut those corners where they can, you know, save money but still be really competitive, and maybe push for the, a spot in the in the Premier League in the next couple of years. Mute. Sorry, the owners of Barnsley have uh, I've got a little bit of a network going on actually, yeah. Um so they've got I think they've got a club called Nancy, they've got a club called FC Thune, um and one or two others, I think maybe one in Belgium. Um but yeah, they've they've got that kind of as you say, bit of a network going on with clubs and obviously the really good with managerial recruitments, but the problem with that is with with them still being Barnsley, if they get seen to be doing smart things. I suppose the bigger clubs just kind of poach, just poach their ideas, and it's a shame they didn't they didn't achieve some form of promotion really. But you know, it's just one of them really. Um, so I'm gonna go outside England, but I'm gonna stay. I'm gonna stay in Britain, <laughs> uh, and I'm gonna go to Celtic. So it's in in terms of now, I think they're struggling a bit now. I'll be honest, they're not doing. They're not, they don't seem the most well known at the minute. But I think specifically going back a few years and stuff, they have had an insistent approach to recruitment. They've, they've been able to think outside the box and they've had, they've had to spend wisely because of their aspirations combined with their actual you know, financial wealth given the, given the, the league and stuff like that. Um, I think they've, they've had different approaches to, to finding these ledgers. Like they've, they've showcased their a clear willingness to to kind of pick up what would be the waste, merely maybe off the um, the bigger clubs in Europe. So, say for example, uh, PSG. PSG were willing to let Odds and Edouard go. You know, they couldn't really find a place for him. Edouard's a good player, but he couldn't get a game with PSG. So, he was sold to Celtic. I think Celtic got him for about nine million, and um, it looks like he might be going to Leicester this summer. Edward, so that was really an insistent move, and I think while he's been over there, he scored bags of goals in the Scottish Scottish Premiership. Um, Oliver and Cham, as well as another one, and Dedrick Bayata, got both of them from Manchester City for buttons, really. Um, and both players have contributed really well to, to Celtic. Um, and in addition to signing players from the top clubs who aren't really wanted, they obviously look in relatively obscure markets such as the, the Scandinavian countries for example you know they, they seem to have a bit of a network over in Denmark and Norway and Sweden and places like that I think Christopher Ajay was signed a few years ago from a I think it was Start I think the club was called Start uh, in Norway um, and he's been touted for a few Premier League mo- moves he's about he's well over six foot and he's kind of that player who's a bit of a Bit of a defensive mid slash centre back type player. Hasn't had his Premier League move yet, but plenty of potential. And he's still quite young and stuff. Um and he had a window in 2013-14, which I thought was interesting. Looking looking back now, you know, obviously it's seven or eight years later now. But in 2013-14, Dave, you know, no one really batted an when he brought in Virgil van Dijk and Timu Puki for a total of about five million. You know, that's interesting stuff that when you look back at it now. It really, it really is interesting how things can work out and stuff. And, you know, obviously along, alongside scouting in Scandinavia and picking up the waste of top clubs, they also seem to, to pick up the best Scottish players usually. Um, mm-hmm. So they got in David Turnbull recently after chasing him for quite a while, I think. I think it was from Motherwell. And they were really, really interested in getting John McGinnon as well up until Aston Villa kind of blew them out of the water. So he didn't end up going there, but when he was at Hibs, I think it was Brendan Rodgers was really trying to get him to Celtic, and mm. I think he's since shown a bit of an interest in him uh, at Leicester, but obviously not as materialised there. Uh, funny enough, Dave, on John McGinn, might as well speak about it now. He's been linked a little bit to Liverpool this morning, actually. We're recording on the Wednesday. Um, general thoughts on that one? Um. 
They haven't changed that much from when when he was getting linked with United. And my thoughts then, I think he's a he's a good player. I think he's you know quite a versatile player. I think he's he can do a lot of really good things. You know, he brings different different things to the table, different abilities. Uh, I just I, I could have my eye wiped. I really could, but I just couldn't see him. You know, being that good at Liverpool, I couldn't see him having that much of an impact. I feel like he's at a really good club. That's probably his his level. Now, again, I could be I could be completely wrong. Uh, the, the the links look legitimate, so that to me says that, you know Edwards or Klopp or whoever's kind of looked into him at detail and think you know there's there's something in there that makes him potentially good enough to be a Liverpool player. So. They could well know a lot more than I do, but just my general thoughts, Josh, I think, yeah, good player. Do I think he's Liverpool quality? Uh, not not at the moment. Yeah, I would probably agree. As I said, I think he, as you say, I think he's a good player. I've got nothing really against him, but just from a Liverpool perspective, I think if we were to go there, I would be a little bit surprised. He's left footed, which is nice, and he's quite two footed as well, actually. Um but he's now 26, will be 27 in October. Um, and I think, you know, he's got general nice things about his game. He's, he's a keen dribbler for centre mid. I think he gets forward and gets gets the odd little shot off a goal as well, gets the odd goal for, for a centre mid as well. Quite press resistant, really aggressive without the ball and stuff. Got a good character about him as well. He's quite well rounded and things. But I just think Liverpool will maybe target a bit. A bit, a bit of a higher ceiling there, maybe. Like you know, I always say, Liverpool, you are either world class ability or world class potential. I don't think McGinn takes either of those boxes. Um, I do think he's a good player. I think he's potentially top six quality. You know, if if, if say for example Leicester for, to go for him, if Rogers to, what if Rogers was to retain for him, I wouldn't be overly surprised. I just can't help thinking, considering what he cost, Liverpool will probably get get better out there and you know just going back to Celtic another player I suppose with a bit of a Liverpool link to Celtic is is Ben Davis you know Ben Davis was was all set to go there um free transfer I think it was was agreed to be but Liverpool ended up just signing them and blowing Celtic out towards it a little bit which tends to happen with them you know it's happened with McGinn it's happened with Davis it's something you have to deal with but I just think over the years not so much now uh, but I think over over say the past decade, they've been really clever in how they've got certain players in and how they keep making profits while retaining a certain level and stuff. So I thought, given how the how insistent they tend to be, specifically over the past decade, I thought Celtic were worth the shout. Yeah, I'll be honest. Uh, Celtic were not a, a scene that initially come to me, but I think you make a compelling piece. You know, I think there is some really interesting names said there. I think the you know they have done so well for so long. It's it's only now uh, after nine straight league titles that Rangers finally you know caught up with them um, and can and stop their dominance. But you know to keep doing that year in year out, it was really impressive. And obviously that doesn't just you know fall at fall defeat. You've got to work hard for it, especially in the latter years when obviously Rangers returned um, to to being like a top. Scottish side again, so yeah, you know there is some really interesting players when you sit down and think about who they who they've had or who they've been interested in. Um, and yeah, I, it feels like it's definitely gone sour there over the last twelve months. I don't know if there's been a change with, uh, you know, key personnel behind the scenes or if there's just maybe not the money available. Um, you know, purchases of like or loan moves to the likes of John Joe Kenny and stuff says to me that they're not they're not. Uh, maybe at the level they were, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a strange one. Definitely over the last ten years, I think there's a fair case to throw them in there, uh, based on what you've just said. Yeah, interesting club as I said, and they've just signed the, the odd little player from obscure locations. Like I think, like just looking now, they got Victor Wanyama in from um, mm. Beer Shot AC. I couldn't even tell you that that, that oh, apparently Belgium. Um, but that was that was a decent pickup. You know, they've had Fraser Forster over there, which I suppose is a bit of a varied success, that one. Um but yeah, just in Segure as well, there's another one who designed from C D 
Motagua in Honduras. Mm. Um, obviously, recently as well, it's worth mentioning that they've just appointed a coach from the J League, um, which again is just quite outside the box and just the type of thing that you just don't see that often, particularly in the Premier League. In the Premier League, I think the clubs are just so safe a lot of the time just because they want to stay in the league and keep getting the money in. Mm. I think seeing Celtic just do interesting little things, it just it, it make, makes me take notes every now and then. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair point, definitely, it is. So, um, are, you, are you next? You're next, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, again, um, I, feel, I feel like I'm taking a really obvious route here, but, you know, I just want to say a couple a couple words, you know, a few lines on, 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 on a club who obviously had a really good campaign, Lille, We've again talked about them in the past. You know, often if, if, if me and you were talking about players who who we like the look of, um, or they've been linked with Liverpool and we're kind of assessing their credentials, something that we we like to flag is, you know, where they've come through or, you know, previous clubs that they've been at on the journey to where they are now. And there's a couple of them that we say, um, say is, is a good uh, indicator, good signal. You know, the Red Bull group are always in there. They, you know, they're one of them. Uh, Brighton, we talked about Brighton earlier. I think they're the club that you think, OK, Norwich. And another for me is, is Lille. Um, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen with France because I know Lille were taking, uh, in the French League, sorry, because I know Lille were taking over uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, I think there's issues with debts because of, you know, what's happened with, a money deal over there. Uh, people can read up on that, but basically, you know, it's COVID kind of destroyed their their revenue in terms of it, um, TV rights. So, you know, it's had a bit of a lasting effect on some clubs. I know that Bordeaux, they're, they're in a little bit of trouble. But uh, anyway, yeah, I just think Lille's recruitment on the whole has been uh, has been really good. You know, I think they've they've done a good job of bringing in players who who maybe me and you would. Speak about Josh, or you know, people who kind of look at the data would, would flag as interesting players. And not only have they done that, they've always seemed to then have a recruitment ready once they've sold for, for profit. Um, I'm thinking of Victor Osserman, who uh, who obviously done really well at Lille, goes to Napoli for the fortune. I'm sure, was it around 70 million or something? Yeah. It was a really high fee. Um, and then straight away, they, you know, they then bring in uh, Jonathan David, who I, I played that we, we we flagged, you know, about 18 months ago as, as, as someone that people should be taking note of. Uh, um, he goes over there. And I, I think it took a little while for him to get going, but he's obviously now proven to be a top forward. And I mean, if we just run through the team, you've got a lot of really interesting players in there. You know, you've got Botman, who was, who was linked with Liverpool. We've talked about him before. Samari, you know, another top midfielder that we've talked about. Uh, Sanchez, I feel like we've talked about most of this, most of this starting 11, actually. But, you know, Sanchez, uh, he's, he's, he's with Portugal at the moment at the Euros. You know, seems like he's been around forever, but a, a top player. They've took a gamble on him. Um, and then, yeah, you know, David, Yilmaz up top and stuff. They've just got, they've got a, a lot of really interesting players, a lot of players that seem to show really well in the numbers, they seem to recruit really well, and they had a really good manager, um, who's obviously, what he was getting linked with Everton, wasn't he, but he's, uh, I think he's gone to Nice, hasn't he? Um, but Galtier, you know, Galtier, really top coach, who, who's done a great job there, and this all kind of uh, accumulated to them, to them finally, Ending uh, PSG's control of league earning and, and win the title this season, which is is some achievement in that division. Yeah, the only sad thing with that one is uh, Luis Campos, who seems to have kind of led the whole thing as a sporting director of the club. I think he left around Christmas time, didn't he? Uh, yeah, with the uh, I think that was with the takeover. I think it was a consequence of that. Yeah, so it, you know, it remains to be seen if Leo will keep doing it. Um, but I think one aspect of, of Campos's recruitment at Lille, when when these clubs do this sort of thing, they, they always seem to be really good at also throwing in the odd free transfer and the odd player who is what most club would, clubs would consider to be too old. But Lille, 
like say for example Yilmaz Yilmaz is 35 this season he arrived on a free scored 16 goals and assisted 5 12 of those went on penalty and a few of them were big goals as well Um, he got Jose Font as well on a free he's been integral to them Uh, Jonathan Bambe he got on a free Rafael Leal who I think was also linked with Everton Dave um, mm-hmm. They got him on a free. So these players who did they, they just form an adequate squad at the end of the day. Even the, uh, you know, Sumari who you just mentioned there, he was going to Leicester supposedly. He was a pick up from from the PSG academy. So you just got to be aware of these things, and they're they're quite clearly really good at at spotting them and selling high sort of thing. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna go abroad. For the first time in the pod, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to go to Sampdoria. So, yeah, they've been interesting for the past again, similar to Celtic over the past past few years now. They tend to finish fairly middle of the road in the Serie A table, but if you just look at some of the signings that they've made over the past few years, some real names in there that many people recognise. You know, for example, you know, I'll start with. He signed Milan Skriniar for about 4.6 million from MSK Zelina a few years back. He's obviously now at Inter Milan, just won the league with them. Scored in the Euros, I think, the other day as well. He signed Lucas Terreira for about 2.7 million, apparently. Um, he obviously got a, a about a 25 million pound move to Arsenal shortly after. So, you know, massive profit there. Patrick Schick. Is another one who's having a good Euros. He was signed from Sparta Prague for about four million, just under actually. Jao uh, Chum Anderson is another one. Had a good season in the Premier League at Fulham. Been on loan from Leon, but he was picked up by Sampdoria for about just over one million from a uh, twenty in uh, the Dutch Eredivisie. Great pickup. Um, <clears throat> And Bruno Fernandes as well. Bruno Fernandes has been there. Signed from Udinese for about That's 5 million. Yeah, yeah. Signed from, from Udinese for about 5 million. And in addition to that, I, know that I, I, I can list other players. So you've got Luis Muriel has passed through there. Dennis Pratt, who's now at Leicester. Duvan Zapata is now at Atalanta, scoring bagfuls. And lastly... Michael Damsgaard, who we've spoke about earlier in the podcast, is currently there, I think, and he's been there for about a year, maybe. So, for, uh, he arrived from Nordland. Uh, so, just a really clever club, by the looks of it, really good at picking up on players who end up having top European careers. And it seems to be led by, I think, they're, they're kind of chief scout lead and scout sort of thing, maybe even the director of football, I'm not too sure. Um, I think it's Roberto Pacini. Um but yeah, just a really well-run club who seems to pick up on. I mean, they don't. They could maybe do with finishing, having the odd season where they finish like fifth. But most of the time, they seem to finish like eighth, ninth, that sort of thing. So nothing particularly special in the table, which is maybe why they talked about a little bit less. But when it comes to the recruitments, they've brought a lot of players who are now competing at a high level. A lot of players have passed through Sampdoria. Yeah, yeah, the. Uh... They are, they, they are a club. I mean, I, I must say, there was a couple of names you mentioned there that I was a little bit surprised about. Obviously, I knew, I knew about Damsgaard. Um, but I, I, there was a couple of names that you said there. I was like, oh, like Bruno Fernandes didn't know he was there. But it just shows yeah, that yeah. they are intelligent. And maybe they, that's a little bit of um, the point that where you were saying because they, they're not necessarily successful in terms of, you know, hitting those European spots. Um that it kind of it doesn't bring them to the forefront as much, I guess. But you know, for a lot of clubs, especially like like Sam Dor- Sam Dor- it's, it, it takes a lot to be sustainable in, in top divisions, doesn't it? Um, you know, we haven't got the big revenue and stuff. So yeah, fair play to them. Yeah, really interesting side. Um, I'll let you go next, Dave. Yeah, yeah, just a. A far one for me, a little bit different. Uh, but ironically, we just talked about them. I just, just wanted to flag them briefly. Um, Northland are just FC Northland in Denmark are a really interesting team. 
Um, as a club, they're only about officially 17 years old, but the they haven't had the same success in terms of bringing through high profile names like from um, like say Red Bull Salzburg or something. Um, but you know the the are starting and it, they they kind of it wouldn't surprise me if we saw a lot more players coming through their academy and going on to the really big things. Damsgaard, you know, is is one of the is the biggest who's coming through so far. Um, you know, Denmark are kind of bringing through a little bit of a, a golden era, aren't they? Of really exciting young players, uh, I think they'll they'll be integral to that. Just the way they, they the way they run things, the the, the team who who very much um, focus on youth development. Again, you know, they've, if you look at the if you look at the average age of their side in in the, the uh, Danish Superliga, it's twenty one. Uh, 21 years old, which is insane, really, to, for that to be your average age across the campaign. I remember seeing something on Twitter that they had a... I can't remember exactly what the age was, but they, they broke the record for having, like, the youngest average age of uh, a, a team to play in, in one specific match. And it was it was, it was was teenager levels, you know, below 20. It was a really, really young group of players and I just think their development is is really interesting I think they're going to be a big player in terms of the players that they produce over the next few years they do some really good stuff on YouTube as well if you're interested in that stuff the kind of tactical aspects of what they do behind the scenes you know I've, I've watched a fair few of their stuff on their official YouTube channel if you're interested check it out they do like um they talk about the team tactics and uh play development and they have interviews with the players and it's just a really, really interesting club. As I said, I think in maybe you know five, five years' time, you could you might be able to compile a list of uh, players who've come through their ranks and are now competing at top European sides. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I must admit, I don't, I don't know too much about Norseland. Um I, I obviously picked up on the fact that Dams Garber from there and stuff, but I, I'll have to read up more about them. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go to a bit more obscure now. Well, not, not obscure, but a bit more far out. Uh, Shakhtar Donetsk, I think they're a really interesting club. Uh, they've always interested me a little bit just because of I wouldn't usually associate Ukraine with Brazil. <laughs> uh, but they seem, they seem to. They seem to be the Brazilian experts, really. Um, a very Portuguese-speaking core, really, at the club. And if you look at the players who they've sold, who the players who've been there in the past who have integrated and, and, and essentially brought to Europe, you've got some top players in there. Like you, you know, you've got Fernandinho, William, um, Bernard, Fred, Douglas Costa, um, Alex Tejira, who Liverpool, funnily enough, tried to make Jurgen Klopp's first big sign. In, in his first January, I think it was, but the price was just too steep. But it, it's, I just think it's really interesting the way, you know, they're, they're a club in the middle of Ukraine and they just really, really focus on these Brazilian clubs. Like, the, the, fairly recently, the, a few of the names that they've signed, really young players, they signed uh, a lad called Vital from Palmeiras. They signed a lad called Macon from Corinthians. Tete from Gremio, and they just pride themselves really on kind of that European pathway for Brazilians um, to kind of get away towards, say, for example, the Premier League. Really, uh, I think Benfica offer a little bit of a similar, you know, avenue for the, for these types of players. But because of the core that they've got there, because of their, a lot of these Brazilian players are, are really willing to, to to make the move, and a lot of their the sides at the top of Brazil are really familiar with the business that um the business that can uh, the business that Shakhtar do. So they've got quite got relationships there and stuff like that. And you know, at the same time, in addition to doing that, they, they, they've been able to establish a degree of European and domestic success, you know, while while selling the likes of Fernandinho, William, Bernard and all this. They've, I'm not sure they've lifted the Europa League in the past couple of years, but they've certainly been in one or two finals, I think. Um, mm. And in addition to that, 
they've had the odd manager as well, like for example, Paolo, Paolo Fonseca kind of got recognised quite a bit over there before moving to, I think his next club was AS Roma, and he's currently without a club, but obviously he was heavily linked with the move to Spurs. But while he was at Shakhtar, you know, he was in group stages in the Champions League with Manchester City, and he was playing in a really incessant way. But yeah, just, just the way they've done business over the years, you know, 30 million profits on Fernandinho, about a 30 million profit on, um, what's his name? <laughs> on a... Uh, Douglas Costa, I think it was, and mm. uh, one of the, one of the lads who's currently having a good Euros, although his his nation isn't the best at the minute. Oh yeah, he is. Yeah, he's a uh, Ukraine. So Ruslan Malinovsky is currently playing for for Ukraine in the Euros. I don't think he's registered the goal on assist yet, but he's been really threatening in every game. He was sold to Genk a few years back. Um, but yeah, just an incessant club that just do things differently and seems to have really honed in on this Brazilian. This Brazilian recruitment team, and it's it's worked for them really well. Yeah, I'm just as we're talking now, I'm having a quick look at the squad, and um, you've got <coughs> obviously <laughs> it's quite funny actually. You've got probably just as many uh, Ukrainian nationals as you have Brazilian in in there. Um, there's one, two, three, four, five, six Brazilians currently in the squad that I'm looking at now, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six Ukraine Ukraine-born players in there, which is a uh, which says a lot, really, doesn't it? And that's that's the squad at the moment. Obviously, these aren't you know there's no standout players. Well, you know, a lot of them now aren't particularly standout, but they could be in a few years. And I am I am a huge fan of a of a club kind of owning their position on the food chain I'm I'm making use of it um you know giving it kind of giving it legs and using it to their advantage rather than a disadvantage I think they do that really well they know that they've they've got this um maybe this link or network or road to Brazil whatever it is you know they can bring these players in hopefully they prove to be successful as it has many times in the past and they earn, earn good money through sales doing it Keeps them competitive and it brings in a lot of revenue. And I'm, yeah, I'm a, a big fan of it. Big fan of it. Yeah, just just looking at the departures now. So Alex Tahir, who was linked with Liverpool, was eventually sold for forty five million to a uh, JS Suning in China. Douglas Costa went for twenty seven million. Uh, Luis Adriano as well was a player that I didn't mention. He went to AC Milan, a striker I think he was, for about twelve million. Fernando was a player who, funnily enough, went to Sampdoria. Who I've just been speaking about, um, but yeah, they've just made loads of these big sales. Fernandinho went for thirty-six million, and I've just realised a player that I forgot about, Dave. Uh, Henrik Mkhitaryan was there. Um, he was heavily linked with Liverpool at the time. Was he? Yeah. But he went to uh, Dortmund instead. But that was very much a toss-up. If he was uh, on, on Liverpool Twitter back in them days, that was very much a, a, a sign that every Liverpool fan wanted Mkhitaryan. Um, but yeah, so really interesting club. Um, I think we'll leave it there because we're on the fifty. We're, we're over fifty minutes now. We're approaching the hour mark. So maybe this is one that we can re- revisit next week. We'll see what happens. See what happens towards the end of the summer, maybe. Um, yeah, interesting little episode, Dave. Talk about some clubs that are doing smart things. Not every club has to be a data club. Not every club has to do things the Liverpool way. You just have to do. A, do it in a way I suppose that is successful and a way that works for you and a way that ultimately you're good at implementing. And I think a few of the clubs that we've just touched on there, really different, you know, all doing at different levels in different countries, but doing it in ways that, that are successful, really. Yeah, you know, hats off to any club, no matter how they're doing it, if they're making the, the team competitive on the pitch whilst being sustainable and maybe even bringing in revenue off the pitch whilst, you know, implementing whatever it is that they uh, hat off to them. And, you know, it's really enjoyable to see and, 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 to, and to monitor. Yeah, just, I was, I was going to mention, actually, you know, Atalanta were a club that I was going to mention. Because if you look at specifically in reference to Euro 2020, they've got quite a few players who are, who are now doing well. And the type of players who you'd see doing well and you'd Google and you'd find out who they're playing for. 
and they all seem to be at Atlanta. Like, take for example, uh, Maranchuk is a player, I think, for Russia, who joined from Lokomotiv Moscow for about 13 million. Uh, Mail is a player who I mentioned last week, he joined from Genk recently for about 10 million for them from Denmark. Malinovsky, who I've mentioned for Ukraine, joined from Genk for about 12 million. Uh, Andreas Cornelius, big striker for Denmark, been coming on as a substitute every now and then. About 5 million from Copenhagen. And Robin Goosens, or Goosens, from for the, the uh, German wingback who scored recently. Mm-hmm. He was signed in, t- in 2017 from Heracles for about 1 million. Um, Timothy Castagna joined from At- Atalanta from Genk, who's now at Leicester. Um, and most importantly of all, they got Martin Skirtle on a free fairly recently. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, just another interesting club that I thought I'd flag purely in reference to Euro twenty twenty, really, because they've got they've got lots of players who seem to be doing well. Mm. Uh, but yeah, yeah. This, this could be one that we we revisit anyway in the coming weeks. Let us know what you think. Um, and yeah, thanks for joining us, Dave. Yeah, thank you, mate. Cheers, everyone. Good to be back. Yeah, we'll be back next week. Be sure to tune in. See you then.